I love it. And the days are getting shorter. I don't love that, but anyway. All right, kids, I want to ask you all a question. Do you remember the first time, because it's a family service and we're trying to keep the kids interested. Actually, I'm trying to keep everyone interested, so we'll see what happens. But do you remember the first time you went to stay over at a friend's house, spend the night at a friend's house? In fact, everyone, everybody, you can think back, maybe this was true. You probably had a bunch of fun because everything was new. And you might have had a little bit of homesickness because everything was new. I mean, you liked some things and maybe you didn't like others. Like, they have Fruit Loops. I always loved that because we always only had Cheerios and cornflakes and stuff, but everyone else. And they maybe stay up later and watch cooler TV shows than you're allowed to watch. But, ooh, on the other hand, their dog smells and their little sister smells too. So, you know, you kind of miss home at the end of the day. You go stay with a friend and all in all, you kind of miss home. And uh, you may not like everything about home, but you find you miss it. And you discover as you leave it that you really kind of love it. And when, you know, the next morning you come back home, you're like, ah, this is right. This is how it's supposed to be. You just feel at home. Believe it or not, kids, this happens to grown-ups too. You're, yeah, no kidding, you're not the only ones who love your home. And maybe as a kid, you kind of really only know your home or your town, but as you grow up, you get a chance to stay other places and with other friends, and even in these crazy things called hotels, (laughs) little homes away from home. And maybe you get to travel to different countries and Every time when you come home, I don't know about you, but I almost always feel, ah, this, as I come home, this is good, this is me, this is home. And we all love our home. Now, here's the cool thing. We all love our home, right? But if you were from Japan, you would feel that same way as you got home to Japan. Ah, this is me. And I don't know how you'd say it because I don't speak Japanese. But if you were from Romania, the same thing. Oh, this is home. I love this place. This is where I'm from. Or from Brazil or from Uganda. Or even if you're from Australia, go figure. You would say, ah, this is home, mate. Or whatever. I don't know what they say. But why is that? I think it's because we're wired, generally speaking, we're wired to love our home. And on this day of the year, we think of country. We think of our home country. And we love our home, and we love our country, and we know it's not perfect, but it's ours. Maybe it's the only one you've ever known, or maybe you've chosen to move here and make it your own. But July 4th is the marker day, the birthday for this country, when the Declaration of Independence was published and sent abroad and the terms there contained. And we're already thinking about it today. I don't know if anyone was down at the fireworks last night. It was just great down there at the, by the river. Um, but we're already thinking of it. So let us think together as the church in godly terms about our home, our country. Why do we love it? Why should we? And most of all, how best can we bless our home? If we love our home, we'll want to see the good for it. So how best can we bless our nation? And that really is the big idea that we're going to circle back around to a few times today. How best can we bless our nation? What can we do to bring God's flourishing to our community, to our country, and her people. Turn in your Bibles to Psalm 33. As we think about what it is as believers in Christ that we can do to love our country for its good. In other words, how best can we bless our nation? Psalm 33, I'm just going to Start us in one verse, and then we'll go out from there. We won't look at the whole psalm, but here it is. Verse 12 says this, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Blessed are the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. We're going to use this as our text this morning. Blessed is the nation whose God is Yahweh. 
whose God is the Lord. How is it that we might be able to see God's blessing, God's flourishing, God's goodness on the nation we live in? That's what we're going to address today. God's goodness applied to our country or to our community or to our neighborhood. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. But in order to do that, we have to go back and address something in the background, a background question about Israel. And so we'll do that first. And then we're going to look at the verses in Psalm 33 around verse 12 to see why a nation might want to have God as their Lord or to have, to have the Lord as their God. And then we're going to live it out. Four postures for us to take with us into our week and into our month. So that's what we're looking at. We're going to address a background question, see from Psalm 33 why God as the God is, is the way for a country, and then four postures for us to live out. The background question is this. And so if you're visiting today, we're going through the book of Psalms, and every once in a while we stop to do a little spade work, a little digging to understand how we as the church today can make proper interpretations. And so today, when we read Israel's patriotic texts, ancient Israel, the patriotic texts like this one, we've got to remember something and then translate something. So we've got to remember that ancient Israel has a national identity and a spiritual identity, and they're one and the same. They are an earthly kingdom with a king and taxes and public works departments, just like where we live, and security concerns. And also, ancient Israel in the Old Testament is God's chosen people, the redeemed, to bless the rest of the world. So there's a geopolitical nation state, and there's a spiritual people and that's what's going on in ancient Israel. So when we read the Psalms and the Psalms sing of their great love for country, for them, they're singing it on two levels. The national level, it's my country, it's my home, and I love it. And the spiritual level, Jerusalem is God's dwelling place where God brings forgiveness on this earth. And it's ours. So we sing it as a spiritual people. That's for them. They're reading it on the national and the spiritual. For us, we're not part of ancient Israel. God is not working through nations. But what is he working through? The church. So we have a spiritual identity as the chosen people of God, the redeemed, but that's different than our national identity. See, we don't say today that the church has a national identity. All Christians are in nation A or all people in nation B are Christian. We don't say that because it's not true. We have a spiritual identity as a people of God, but each Christian around the world is going to have a different national identity. If we're from Mexico, we're going to sing of our love and country, of country on what day? Cinco de Mayo. And if we're from France, we're going to sing of our love of country. If we're Christians in France, what day are we going to sing? Bastille Day, July 14th. And if we're from Canada, Canada Day on July 1st, you know, with mosquitoes and maple syrup. And on and on. And you just go through the list of countries, and that's great. And in America, we sing of our love of country on the 4th of July and the other national holidays, Thanksgiving and Juneteenth, because we're grateful for what God has done in our country and doing in our country. But the point is, we have a spiritual, as believers, we have a spiritual identity the church of Christ, that's separate from our national identity. When we read in the Psalms, it's one and the same. For ancient Israel, it's one and the same. They can read patriotism spiritually. We have to do a work of translation. Does that make sense? Am I making sense? I hope I'm making sense. So what we do is we read them on two levels. On the spiritual identity level, we take the promises of God contained there about his redemptive work in the world, we apply them to the church. And on the national, I love my country level, we take the principles that are contained there and translate them appropriate for whichever nation we live in, which for us happens to be the United States. 
Psalm 33, verse 12, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Look at the next line. The people whom he's chosen as his heritage. Well, that second line applies to the church. That does not apply to Canada or France or Japan or America. The people he's chosen for his heritage. That's the church. But the first line, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. It's not going to apply to America in the same way as it applied to ancient Israel as a statement of their identity or a statement of some time past when it was true. How is it going to apply to us? How do we take the principle there for today? Here it is, church, as a prayer and as an aspiration and as a goal. That's what we're longing for. We're longing that blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. That would be our prayer as we pray for our country. May more and more and more and more people turn to you, Lord Jesus, that you, Yahweh, might be their God. And it's an aspiration, oh, that this would happen. And it's a goal that we work towards, which we'll get to in the third half of the show. But does that make sense? This is a great prayer, a great aspiration, and a great goal, but it's not a statement of identity or a nostalgia for some time in the past. Now, why, second part of the, why is a nation blessed when God is their God? Well, let's look at the psalm, and we're just going to look at several verses around verse 12 to see why a nation is blessed when Yahweh is the king of that, the God of that nation. Look at, start at verse 10, Psalm 33, verse 10, the Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of God's heart to all generations. There's two different types of counsel, the counsel of the nations and the counsel of the Lord. Which one stands? It's not a rhetorical question. <laughs> God's counsel stands. Why is a nation blessed when God is their God? Because the world's counsel will not stand. Now, what does counsel mean? Well, the plans and the purposes, the thoughts. When a nation builds on the thoughts and reasonings of humanity, those never last. They always fail. They're shifting sand. But when a nation builds their laws and their structures and their systems and their ethics on God's counsel, his word and his truth, well, they're building on what will last. So the world's counsel will not stand. Why bother having God as your, as your God? Because the world's counsel, the counsel you can find out there in the world will not last. Let's read verses 13 and onwards and see the second reason why the Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all. You know, we could stop right there. He sees all. <laughs> Do you know that? Do you know that God sees all? You could just highlight that in your Bible or circle those three word, words. He sees all. The Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all the children of men. From where he sits enthroned, he looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the heart of them all and observes all their deeds. All, all, all. You know what it is here? God sees all. He knows what's going on in your life, and in my life, in your home, and in my home, in your workplace, and in my workplace. In fact, let's get personal for a minute and pretend it's not July 4th. That secret sin that you are carrying around with you, that you are hoping no one will know, God sees it. When you change the rules depending on who's in front of you, God sees that. When you click on that image that you know you shouldn't, God sees that. 
when you take a 90-minute lunch but you're only allowed an hour, because no one will know, God knows. When you lie or fudge, we call it fudge, on the application, God sees that. And he sees politicians when they line their pockets and husbands when they leave their wives. And he sees teenagers actively disobeying their parents. And he sees spiritual leaders when they fleece the flock. God sees it all. In these verses, the clear purpose is accountability. We are accountable, every one of us, before a holy God for what we do as humans. All the inhabitants of the earth, he says. Romans 1 and 2 talks about God putting right and wrong in every human heart so that all may be accountable before him. God sees all. My friends, on this day, don't continue in sin. Don't continue with that secret that you hope no one will find out about. Don't continue with that little tiny growth on your character that you don't want to address, but it'll grow. This weed will grow and overtake the whole garden. No, God sees all. Don't continue in sin. Come clean before him. Turn back to him. He already knows it. You don't have to hide any longer. Say, Lord, forgive me. Lord, I need you. Lord, I'm wrong. And watch him. Forgiveness. Turn to him and he turns to you. You take that one step to him and he comes running with all of his love and mercy. Oh, when we think nationally, yes, God sees all, but don't forget the gospel that he sent his son to meet us in our deepest, ugliest sin and bring us into the glory of his family and forgiveness and cleanness of conscience and life. Okay, so why is it that a country, a nation, or a community, or a people should have God as their Lord? Well, the world's counsel won't stand, but God's will. And God's God sees everything that's going on, so live under him. The next couple of verses tell us the next one, verses 16 and 17. The king, the government, the country, the king is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his great strength. The war horse is a false hope for salvation, and by its great might, it cannot rescue. The world's power will not prevail. The war horse and the great warrior and the king with his army, none of them will ultimately prevail. The strength of one's military, the size of one's economy, the political leadership, the academic or cultural triumphs, all of them are fleeting. They all go away. They will not last. They will not win. They will not prevail They'll fade, and we know it. But blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, whose God brings whatever blessings there are, not my army and my economy and all that stuff. And then the last thing in verses 18 and 19, behold, the eye of the Lord, again, God sees, but now in a different way. Watch this. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love, that he may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in the famine. Who does God watch out for here to save and deliver? Those who fear him. God sees in verses 18 and 19, those who hope in him. Why? Would a country, why would a state, why would a community, why would a family want the Lord to be their God? Because God is on the lookout. Yes, a few verses ago to hold accountable because he's righteous and holy. But yes, because he's gracious here, he's on the lookout for those 
who are tender and humble before him and willing to give to him everything. He knows how to deliver those who belong to him. And he'll guard us and guide us and deliver us. Now look, he's not going to deliver us from all hard things. He'll deliver us through all the hard things. He will walk with us and bring us more to be like Jesus. The Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they went into the furnace. They didn't get a get-out-of-jail-free card. They had to keep trusting him. But God sees those who hope in him. God saves those who hope in him. God delivers. So blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. What a prayer. What an aspiration. What a goal to have before us. And why is it blessed? Because the world's counsel will not stand and the world's power will not prevail. And God sees all the sin and God sees those who hope in him to deliver them. Thanks be to God. What a great framework as you think about your home. Blessed is the nation. Blessed is the state. Blessed is the community. Blessed is Eastern North Carolina if their God is the Lord. Well, let's now live it out. How do we bless our nation? How do we best bring God's blessing, God's goodness, in a tangible, physical way, to the world around us. Let me offer four postures for us as believers who love our home. And that's what patriotism is, right? A love of home, a love of home country. How best can we bless this place God has given us to live? Well, four postures for a healthy patriotism or a healthy love of country. Number one, we are grateful. Let us give thanks for the good things of where we live. They're many. (laughs) They're manifold and they're manifest. This country is an idea. It's not an ethnicity like many countries in the world. And it's not an ideology like we have seen in several countries in the world over the years. And it's not an iron-fisted ruler with a bunch of people who can't escape, like we've seen again and again in history. This country is an idea. And what is the idea? That every individual person has God-given rights. Rights to what? Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These are given by the government? No, thanks be to God. Given by the creator. That's the idea behind this country. And the second thing is that the government exists to safeguard those rights. In a lot of other places in time, it was the other way around. The people exist to contribute to the government. That's not true in the idea of this country. Every individual person has God-given rights, and the government exists to safeguard those rights. That's revolutionary in world history, right? That is absolutely revolutionary in world history. And that's something you can be grateful for, and you are, I'm sure, for living in a place where that is true. And we can see... Without at all, and I don't know if you heard the podcast this week, without at all being jingoistic, because I I just can't stand that, or nationalistic or, or chauvinistic, but we can see America as a driver, these ideas of individual liberty and and government safeguarding that, we can see that as a driver of freedom in the last 250 years around the world. And that's something we can be thankful for. That's incontrovertible. And we can be grateful, and we really can be grateful, but we can also grieve. We have to grieve, because are we perfect? No. Have we ever been perfect? No. Was there ever an era that, oh, we should go back to? No. We have to grieve. All the marvelous promises that you guys weren't even sure if you could say amen to two minutes ago, 
All those marvelous promises were denied to the population of slaves from the moment they stepped off the boat. And once emancipation came in 1863, and then four and five, a new set of laws sprang up to keep African Americans down. That's grievous. Alongside those laws, a reign of terror that was off the law books but kept enchained many people across, many citizens. And when the, fi the nation finally made good, on the promissory note that all men are created equal through the work of the civil rights movement in the 50s and the 60s, at almost exactly the same time, 1965, the Great Society Act decimated the black family and then turned around and enslaved millions of white and black citizens to depend on the government in generational terms. All and each of these things are grievous, and I grieve for them all. And every country has things in their history to grieve. So America is not uniquely evil, but it's our grief. <laughs> this is our home. And what's unique about America is that we take seriously the ideals of our founding. All men are created equal and government is there to safeguard liberty. And we see when those failures have been real and egregious, and it makes it stark and uncomfortable. So it's okay to grieve, even as we're grateful, and we are grateful. But you know, the things we grieve about in our country are not only related to race and power. Don't you grieve a general loss of a moral compass and our compatriots? Don't you grieve kids in neighborhoods who barely have a chance? Because on the one hand, they're witnessing things that destroy their innocence. Just talk to any, I mean, I just think of our, our teachers just weeping for the kids they love, coming out of situations that destroy their innocence on the one hand, and on the other hand, they're not learning patterns of self-discipline that we all know we need in life for maturity. What else do we grieve for? We grieve when courts or administrations or governments undercut truth and justice and restraint and common sense. And we grieve when a population barely cares as long as the Wi-Fi is up. We grieve because there's an entertainment culture that makes doing well and doing good look dumb and disappointing. And we grieve because big tech is changing thought patterns of all of us. We grieve because millions of babies are aborted and millions of souls are incarcerated. And we grieve because a church across the country is complacent or worse, eager to maintain whatever position of influence it thinks it has. These are hard things to hear, but grieving is part of loving. Ask any parent who looks at the decisions their kids make that they wouldn't make. Ask any parent of a wayward child. Grieving is part of deep love. And here's why it's helpful. It leads us to ask for God's mercy and to ask for God's healing and to seek his heart-searching spirit to reveal where I need forgiveness. Lord, you show me where do I need your ways. Listen, as we love our country, we are right to love where we live, our home. We are right to give thanks for all the amazing things God has done for 250 years. It is unbelievable. And if you don't believe me, that's why a million people come here every few months. Because they want the freedom that we talk about. 
But while we're grateful, we grieve when we don't live up to that freedom. Let me tell you, that's a great thing. They're not grieving in other countries in the world, right? I mean, they're, they're grieving, they're lamenting in a different way, but we're saying, no, we're not living up to our ideal. And we, the church, in our gratitude and our grief, we get to, by those acts and in that posture, bring God's blessing to our nation. All grief and no gratitude, you're not building a nation. All gratitude and not grief, you're not living in reality. Both, both. Thanks be to God. So then we keep moving. Two more. We're hopeful as those who love our nation and want to see God's kingdom come through his church, even in our communities. We're hopeful. God's not done. We're not throwing in the towel. (laughs) We're just not doing it. This home of ours is a great place to live and thrive and raise our kids. Others see that, and we want everyone to enjoy its fruits. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. So we keep aspiring to it, praying towards it, working towards it, because we know it's God's heart. Because God wants America and Cambodia and Kenya and Denmark and all the rest to have him as their God. This is something we can pray with joy and we can be hopeful because God is not done in his work in our communities on this earth. Thanks be to God. And this drives us then to the last one. I said there's four postures. We are grateful, we are grieving, we are hopeful, and we are helpful. Amen. I tried to get two G's and two H's. Helpful. What does that mean? Helpful. We're involved. We're willing. We're active. Listen, first of all, It means being 100% committed to the local body of believers because all that God is doing to ultimately bless this world, he's doing through the local church. We are it. Remember Matt Henderson used to live here, went off to Georgia to help plant a church, Matt and Alicia Henderson. Matt Henderson said, when God wants to change a country, he doesn't use a ballot box, he uses revival. And that's where it starts. As we're thinking of gratitude and grief and hopefulness and helpfulness, first, it's us in this together. We are the church of Jesus Christ, God's chosen instrument to bring the kingdom. We're citizens of heaven and we're ambassadors here on earth. But then how else can we be helpful? And and by the way, this is what I love about our church is we're so active beyond the walls. Like some, some people think, oh, well, church, and it, you're, just, you're leaving the world, you're becoming a monk. No, we're just like, as it were, the huddle so we can get back out into the game in our workplaces, in our communities and stuff. So how do we do that? When we think specifically then of uh, love of our homeland, love of country, well, vote and vote informed. Don't just vote what you used to vote. Vote informed. But vote. Vote twice if you need to. No, I'm kidding. I'm just kidding. We're not living in Chicago. Vote. (laughs) Vote. Choose and work for candidates who most reflect Christ's priorities in their platform and integrity in their person. That's what we're looking for in candidates. And so do some research and then start, if, you, if you're led to it, start supporting them and, and work for them, canvas for them or whatever. Run for office yourself. I mean, really, this is a fantastic thing. They're dying to do this in North Korea. Run for office. In fact, let's get really local. For those of you who live in Kinston, the filing uh, time is open, July 2nd to July 16th, to run for city, to file so that you can run for city council or for mayor. If you have a different idea of how our little city should be run, you can be part of that by running. Pray, seek counsel. Maybe the Lord would have you run but he's going to have people run. Pray for them. Pray that the Lord would bring the right ones 
Now, that's ways to be helpful. That's ways to be helpful in sort of the political arena, but as we think of love of country beyond politics, because maybe, you know, canvassing isn't your thing, and that's okay, write letters to the editor. Write letters to your elected representatives, or call them if they're local enough and you can. Let them know what you think on the issues. They want to hear from us. That's wonderful. They don't always listen, but they want to hear from us. Be involved in schools. Be involved in schools, reading and tutoring or after school programs. Reading and tutoring, helping with homework and stuff. Be involved in community things like Boy Scouts or Trail Life or Girl, Girl Guides. Be involved, you know, the League of Honorable Young Men. Have you ever heard of that? Sons of Issachar Ministries with Kayam Shepherd. The League of Honorable Young Men, where they've men where they've adopted their church, Sons of Iskar, has adopted a Jack Roundtree um, housing project, and they go and they take kids, you know, four or five maybe, I, I think the younger age is right there, up through 10 years old. He says, if we wait until middle school and high school, we've lost them. But here's this, this uh, father figure, Kyam Shepherd and, and, and Coach Mike and all the others, and they're saying, let's love these boys to become honorable young men, because that's the generation. I mean, I love this. We can get involved like that, helpful like that. And I love, I love the number of teachers in the public system at Grace. I love that we have teachers called to love and teach and character formation with kids. Imagine 20, 25, 28 kids for 180 school days. In the elementary where you only have one set of classes. Sorry, I forgot about you people in high school. We have 100 kids, but imagine that. I mean, the reason I even like history today is because of a high school teacher. Teachers change lives. Thanks be to God that so many at Grace are called to teach. Patriots who are hopeful are patriots who are helpful. Folks who love their home. When we're hopeful, we then start doing it. In fact, I think that's why, you know, one of the first things that happens is... Um, in, in a downtime, the enemy wants us all to lose hope because then we just stay at home and think, well, I can't do anything. And that's, that's the enemy's number one rule on his playbook. And he, by the way, he has no creativity. He uses the same playbook in every disaster and every trauma. He just wants us to lose hope because then we just sit back. There is hope God is not done with our city, with your street, with our state, with our economy, with our friends, with the justice system. God is not done with our country and with the countries of the world. There's hope. So we, the only ones who know about the reality of heaven, are the ones to bring the most help in tangible ways and by praying and proclaiming the gospel. God will give to each of us a burden to be involved in different ways. It's not that we all have to now be, you know, trail life leaders. No, we are going to be involved in a hundred and a thousand different ways, but together following the Spirit, we'll see Him work. The best love of country we'll ever exhibit is this aspiration. Lord, may you be the God of my neighbors, my community, my country. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And that's going to drive us to say, well then, Lord, how can I be part of bringing that blessing? By practicing gratefulness, by grieving when we need to, by being hopeful and not giving up hope, and by stepping out in helpfulness. And God's going to do the rest. 195 years ago, two guys died hardly news, 195 years ago today, two guys died. Friends who became enemies who reconciled. 
Thomas Jefferson and John Adams, the second and the third president, they both died on July 4th, 1826, the 50th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. And Thomas Jefferson and John Adams, if you've seen the Hamilton Broadway show, you'll know they were great enemies. Or if you've read history, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you'll know they worked together and then they went through a long period uh, of being, um, of being a, uh, against each other or just not, not together. And it was Benjamin Rush, Dr. Benjamin Rush, that sort of reconciled them. Uh, it was the French Revolution, interestingly enough, that, ha that caused their falling out. So you can read that on another time. The last 14 years of their lives, they wrote letters back and forth from Monticello to uh, Massachusetts up in Boston area. I don't know that they ever saw each other again. I, I just I don't know the whole story, but they wrote letters and we have 158 or 160 letters back and forth between these two founding fathers reflecting back on all of their lives and their country and the problems around us and so on and so forth. And Thomas Jefferson famously in one of the letters, I don't know exactly where, but he said, you and I have lived in serious times. And that I think was true for them. And I think it's true for us. You and I are living in serious times. We're not where we were three years ago, two years ago. God is doing a work in our midst. He's loosening roots to bring us deeper into gratitude and grief and hopefulness and helpfulness. To call us to love our country in the way of the gospel which is seeking his blessing, not seeking our strength. Because the counsel of men doesn't stand and the power of men doesn't prevail. God does. He sees all and he sees those who hope in him to deliver them. So let us be those kind of people as here we live in serious times. Let's pray together. Father, we ask that you would do this work in us. We are so thankful for your word that guides us and reveals to us your ways and your character and your purposes. And we're so thankful for your spirit in us that builds us up and, and encourages us and gives us strength and empowers us. And so today we ask that you would help us your people in Eastern North Carolina to be part of bringing your blessing to our community and our country. Let us not be on the sidelines or on the wrong side of what you're doing. Give us to be led by your spirit for your glory that Christ's kingdom might be built up. We thank you for hearing us and for answering in Jesus' name, amen. And so my brothers and sisters, we go out, I hope, to a great rest of the day and even a great tomorrow if you have it off. Spend time with family, give thanks and grieve, but rejoice that God has called us to this day and this moment and this time, these serious times. And as we go, we don't go alone. We go with the love of God and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen? Amen. Go in peace.